Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining our stock broking round table. My name is Kartika and I'm from Lead Squared's marketing team. Today we will be discussing the digital age of stock broking, how stock brokers are redefining trading for millennials. And we have a quite a bit uh, panel. We have a very big panel today and I will just introduce all our speakers. Uh, so we have Mr. Uh, Shishupal Rathor, who is the senior vice president of technology at Motilal Oswal. We have Mr. Ashley Almeida, who is the EVP of digital product and marketing at Religair. Uh, we have Mr. Gaurav Garg, who is the associate director at JM Financial Limited. We have Mr. Anand Sharma, who is the head of platforms and design at Edelvis. We have Ms. Hina Qureshi, who is the head of digital business at Mire Asset Capital Markets. And we also have our host for today, who is Ms. Ruchika Mera, uh, the director of enterprise sales here at Lead Square. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule and joining us today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to learning a lot from you all. And yeah, so before we start the session, I just have a small note to the audience. We do have a questions tab. So during the session, if you have any doubts and questions, uh, please do put it up there. We will take it up towards the end of the session. We will also put up a few polls. Please do interact with it. We'd love to hear from you. So with that, I think I'll hand over the session to our host. Ruchika, please take it forward. Thank you so much, Kartika. Hi, everyone. A, a very well, you know, a warm good evening to everyone. Uh, before we begin, you know, uh, just few stats and, you know, few observations that we made around the DMAT opening. Now, the buzzword that's been going in the stockbroking industry, that Tina, you know, there's no alternative factor. So that's something which has become the new mantra for our equity markets, which has been fueling, you know, a sharp rally. And why so, right? Because if we see the DMAS accounts have actually witnessed an unprecedented jump of 63%, which is 289.7 million, you know, in FY21-22. And this growth has been underpinned by factors such as increase in smartphone usage, easier onboarding of customers and attractive returns, which are delivered by the equity market. So we've actually seen, you know, that post-pandemic, we have seen around 2.2% times increase in the overall number of DMAT accounts with uh, over 2 million DMAT accounts being opened every month. Now, this brings us to a very interesting topic, you know, how the shift has been. At last two years, there has been a tremendous shift in the overall way in which our stockbroking houses in India perform. So, bringing us to this, the digital age of stockbroking and how the entire digital transformation has been, you know, I have... Uh, you know, uh, we'll start with our discussion and the first thing which I have around, you know, like just to set a base of it. So we have a lot of tech savvy millennials who are attracted towards discount broking platforms and firms who are trying their best to woo them. Now, there's also one uh, thing which, you know, uh, the question that has been raised that the new age discount brokers, they do not provide the investment advice or guidance, which is provided by a full service broker. But according to CAM study, 86% of the new millennial investors, they still by intermediaries such as financial advisors, banks, distributors, and other agencies. So keeping in mind the dilemma of the investor, where do you see, you know, um, and that the question is to Ashley, I'll start with you. So this question is to you. Where do you see the trend in the Indian stockbroking market moving towards? Do you see a DIY process, or you still think the hybrid model will prevail? Yeah, thanks for that uh, question, Rachika. So uh, I think the way to look about, uh, you know, think about this entire uh, aspect is think about why do people open accounts? The fundamental reason why people open accounts is to make some kind of return, right? And therefore, it is important for the platform or the broker to aid that customer to be able to make that return. Mm -hmm. So I don't see it as a surprise that, you know, 86% of millennials are looking for that kind of support. Because if you had to break those users down, you would find them largely fitting into two buckets. Either they don't have the time or they don't have the expertise. 
And I think what brokers can do is enable users, uh, obviously, with a lot of insights, because there's so much action going on in the markets that you cannot keep an eye on everything. So therefore, what insights can you provide to help them make better decisions? Uh, the other aspect is about giving them sufficient research calls, which makes it easier for them to also identify companies that they should invest in. And uh, along with that, a lot of uh, analytical information, a lot of blogs where, you know, expertise can be provided, educational webinars. So I think that brokers can do a lot to help these millennials using all these uh, variety of ways. But it's a given that they need help and brokers need to not only provide them a convenient platform, but also a platform wherein they can aid them in making good decisions. Great, great. I agree with you, Ashley. Thanks for that. And, uh, you know, I would like to understand Anand's thought on it. Anand, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on it? Do you think a complete DIY process is still, you know, something which India is ready for? Or you think, you know, there's still, as Ashley mentioned, you know, there is some kind of advice, there is some kind of handholding that would still be required? So to continue Ashley's uh, viewpoint, uh, when he's saying that, and the role of the broker need not be uh, only to give the platform to transact, but also to advise and enable with a lot of tools, data points, information, content, different kind of things, so that uh, people are able to take decisions. Take a step back and uh, let us let us try to see that uh, different players are there right now in the market, uh, so-called discount player, discount brokers or new age brokers, and traditional brokers. If you see this uh, discount brokers or traditional brokers, they started their uh, business largely with transactional platform, wherein the, the advantage was on the pricing side. Thanks. However, still currently they are providing their platform to transact, but they are also or they have also started enabling their platforms with other platforms in fintech industry, which are playing the role of the advisor. It is not independently transaction platform. Uh, and when you refer to CAM study where 86% of millennials are uh, taking uh, opinion or views or advice from different sources of players, that trend is there and will continue. Uh, however, there is a different trend. Earlier, Avatar was that uh, transaction used to be done by the dealers or, or the relationship managers or order functions. That, that trend has changed and that will not come back again. The power of transacting or putting the transaction will be continued by the independent individual. However, to take the decision, either to take the advice or to uh, revalidate their thought process or their research, they will still rely on experts uh, before they commit their money for long term. That will continue. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that. And here, Rohina, I would also like to understand, you know, uh, your thoughts on it. We see a lot of, you know, uh, first of all, congratulations for Instock. And we see a lot of, you know, trends at your side on the DI. So you think that uh, the trend for hybrid, which Ashley and Anand believe, uh, you know, will persist? Or are you of the opinion or are you of a different opinion altogether? So uh, thank you for asking the questions and thank you for uh, uh, mentioning about uh, the launch. So for me, I suggest a different altogether new segment. So I will not go by a DIY or a hybrid model. I will talk about a new segment that we have entered into, which is zero brokerage. So uh, that, that's how it's going to be about it. So uh, the pricing is very, very important factor. And I agree to Anand where he mentioned that uh, irrespective of platform which is available for execution for the customers okay advice is important now the advice would be in a different form whether you talk about a diy model or a hybrid model ultimately advice would be available for the customers on the platform itself it's in a different shape and form it could be in a form of a video it can be in a form of a, a, a bit size information but it's going to be there for the customer in fact so uh, the question that I was coming to, and Shishupal, that's for you. Uh, so 
we talk about you know a customer base of around 90 million in uh, demat account holders whereas the a uh, base that we have for overall pan card is around you know close to 500 million so there's a huge momentum that you know the demat account is going to continue to grow at a moderate pace but and also at the same time the stock brokers have seen that 70 to 90% of the accounts opened in last two years are primarily from non metro the tier 2 tier 3 cities now with you know i wanted to understand with technology no longer a barrier for tier 2 and tier 3 millennials what more should the stock broking houses do to attract more investments you know into stock markets from tier 2 and tier 3 cities and maybe if you can throw some light on you know what are your ideas around it and that's for you shishupal sure sure uh thanks for asking that question uh, i would just take you know the conversation forward from where you know hina was just mentioning about different segments so okay, uh, think, as you maybe, mentioned Rushika, Shishupal, you know, can you hear me or i yes, think there's some technology glitch for us you want to take that up uh hina can you hear me uh, we can hear you hear you shishupal you can we can hear shishupal okay. okay uh so what i was really trying to say is you know uh, that uh, we know that technology has actually blurred the boundaries you know so whether it's a tier 2 or a tier 3 or a metro you know our technology is uh, available everywhere you're in proceed there seems to be some internet issue on your side perhaps yeah there seems to be some internet issue on your side perhaps yeah i think that's a glitch on ruchika's side shishpal you can continue uh, okay. yeah yeah so basically you know we know that uh, technology actually has blurred the boundaries you know and uh, whether it's a tier 2 city or a tier 3 city or a metro basically technology is available everywhere if you have a you know a good internet connection basically and if you have a mobile app with you uh, you can actually trade from anywhere so basically what i really feel that the issue is not about technology the issue is more about building that awareness you know making them aware of basically uh, how they could transact you know what all is needed basically from an advice perspective where they should invest so it's more about telling a story which is more of a wealth creation story okay and how we can really build wealth in the short term goal based and a long term so if you are able to tell that story you know educate our customers basically whether it's a gen z or a gen y millennials basically i think technology is available to them as you know was saying basically it's more about the advice will be available if we can put that advice somewhere in the platform itself you know it could be more of a nudge it could be more of a soft recommendation that you could provide basically while uh, the customers are uh, transacting i think that is how i think uh, more and more customers are going to be uh, overall uh, work uh, transacting with the stock market what they really need is basically uh, the other thing that they would need is the pros and cons basically uh, a, an advice basically a call or uh, on top of that an overall awareness so i think basically if they are able to do that either through some educational platform or educational uh, videos basically or in physical basically that is how i feel that uh, uh, the gen z and gen y are really going to you know overall uh, feel a uh, more secure and you know get more attracted towards the stock market yeah um yeah thank you uh, mr shishpal i think that uh, ruchika is just reloading her page okay. but uh, if someone else wants to add to this uh... yeah kartika i would like to share one perspective you know which is uh, i agree that you know the client servicing as uh, shishpal said client servicing and client advising is like you know these are the two criteria which would uh, make stock market investment popular in tier 3 tier 4 cities as well right so the point is that you know when we look at you know we generally think that the technology is available but if you look at mobile penetration in india it is you know 40 to 50% but if you go beyond india which is bharat right there the penetration of smartphone is so low that these people uh you know they do not have the ecosystem which is available for investing or trading in stock market so i would say that you know the client servicing and client advising would go hand in hand and that technology will also improve along with the time if we really want to make sure that our industry is able to catch up when the you know bharat also has the same kind of uh, ecosystem available and the penetration of smartphone availability so that time if client servicing and client advising is in place so i think our industry is in good hands and we have long way to go definitely mr okay. gorav thanks yeah, for that so back so yeah so i would I, like I, to I, add an additional point to it uh, i think one key aspect 
which will help in the penetration is also making you know platforms as well as content uh, content available in vernacular languages i think that is also going to be key in driving penetration in other cities especially tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 even and also breaking down content and you know taking away jargons and making it more and more laymanish because jargons tend to intimidate and complicate so how much of it can be broken down and uh, given to that user set will also determine how much penetration can happen from uh, those kind of cities yeah. So, so I would like to add here what Ashley mentioned, which is very, very relevant point that content is king and the language is now the way forward. Uh, so apart from tech and the ease of use is very, very important. I personally believe that pricing will matter uh, in tier two and three, tier three, though Anand is uh, smiling about it, but I firmly believe that that's going to be game changer in that uh, uh, tier cities when we talk about uh, tier two and tier three and the way the content and the communication is is being communicated to these client segment would really really be uh, creating a lot of impact and definitely would upsurge the penetration penetration in tier two and three, tier three cities basically so in a, i have a point to make in addition to what my friends have said on this forum uh, the interesting thing, what is going to happen right now, what I personally feel that this is the start where uh, adoption of financial product or investments have started in India. And uh, innovations will have started taking, uh, taking uh, the speed from last five years or so. And primarily innovations are being done by non-financial guys, are being driven by technology guys. That, that means what? that now techies are understanding common man's pain point and trying to address those challenges. And once this investment opportunities goes out of complex environment and made simple, I think the, the market is very big. India is a big country with a lot of population and uh, we are growing at a good speed. Though I, I feel that for, for next couple of years, things will settle down from what it happened in the last two years. But uh, but future is really, really bright because a lot of innovation uh, will happen. It is just a start that we are at right now. Yeah. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that. And, you know, we've been talking about tier two, tier three cities, penetration in India. Now, let us talk more of a larger picture. Now, you know, in a recent development of NSE's international exchange, so they've given Indian investors an option to trade in U.S. stocks. Now, I wanted to understand here, and uh, Shishupal, this question is for you. How do uh, Indian stockbroking houses, you know, plan to be ahead of this curve in providing a seamless fintech experience for investors uh, to invest in global markets? So what's your take on that? I think, you know, uh, many of the stockbroking houses, if you see, has already started, you know, uh, integrating with a lot of uh, uh, global uh, stock broking uh, agencies as well as uh, the stock markets basically so there are multiple ways in which uh, uh, we can provide that service to the customers it could be basically you know directly transacting in uh, the uh, in the global stock market basically by buying stocks or through basically you know funds which uh, if you see motilal Oswal also has launched global funds basically in which you can invest and you know those uh, uh, those get invested in a lot of global uh, stock market and then there is a third one in which you, you can uh, you can buy a portion of a stock basically you know uh, google and apple being really expensive stocks so you know basically you can uh, buy a portion of that stock so there are different ways in which uh, most of the stock brokers even motilal oswal has enabled uh, you know uh, the customers to buy stock globally but what i really uh, feel you know is important is also to share the story of the pros and cons you know investing in a global market um, basically, you know, the, the foreign currency is involved. So, you know, the up and down in the foreign currency itself would impact the overall 
uh, profit and loss of the customer so basically while transaction and you know doing business or buying stocks basically globally is one thing but also they have to understand the pros and cons of buying in a foreign currency so if you are able to tell that and if you are able to enable the platform you know connecting with different stock markets globally uh, especially uh, what we have seen is an interest in the technology stock market across not only us but we are also hearing a lot from you know markets like israel and some of the global innovation hubs so basically if uh, we have been able to connect with them now it's more important that uh, as the customers transact there you know uh, they should also understand the the cons of it not only the pros of it so i feel the trend is on the uptrend but basically at the same point in time it's important to build that awareness if anyone else has to share anything on that okay uh, thanks for that uh, anyone else would like to take that up uh, i also have a follow up question to it but anyone else would like to add on to you know uh, this thing anand you want to take that up yeah i think in terms of global investing definitely uh, there is an opportunity there is an interest and uh, beside tying up with international players uh nsc has also understood the potential of it and recently introduced a couple of uh, scripts or markets uh yeah. in which with indian brokers uh indian investors will be able to invest uh with indian ex- using indian exchanges so definitely there is potential and and uh, we feel that uh there will be a lot of traction especially uh, new generation coming into picture with a lot of money because Uh, we all are aware that uh, this new generation which is the gen z gen y is having high income and uh, if we as a uh, as a responsible companies guide them well in terms of how to make their money invested in a right way i think uh, this is also an opportunity which will give them global exposure great thanks uh, gorav what are your thoughts on that um uh, so as anand and uh, shishupal said that you know this is a great opportunity and it is going to grow what i want to add that ease of uh, using these platforms right so i think uh, as of now you know we need to have a lot of uh, you know the strong middlewares with most of the stock brokers which make sure that the onboarding for uh, you know overseas investment is as easy as you know we have if you want to invest in our own country the second is that you know which uh, shishupal rightly said that you know uh one thing is starting investment the second point is uh that second point is uh, you know what do you uh having the access of right research you know where do you invest it it is not like that it is not like that uh, you know you just uh, i'm sorry you know there was some problem uh, so basically what happens you know if you want to invest there has to be a visibility it is not like that you have a uh, you know you are using netflix or amazon on the basis of you start investing there has to be a logic there has to be a visibility lot of people don't have visibility and they are losing when they are making these kind of investments using a brand is a different thing but having a story behind that the actual growth actual number has to be there so that visibility is not there with most of the investors so instead of creating wealth they are losing their money in overseas investment so i think it it will evolve over a period of time and uh, yes it has a long way to go and uh, i think it will be one of the asset class which will be evolving along with the time right. so there's a follow up question to it and actually um, you know i would want you uh, to take that up so one is investing you know via the nsc ifsc solution where you are directly not investing into the shares instead you know you are buying what is known as unsponsored depository receipt but in contrast to that you can also invest so when you are investing through a broker you know you can directly become a shareholder of the company now here i want to understand from you what are the pros and cons that you see in direct investment vis-a-vis you know the nsc ifsc platform Ruchika, Ashley is not audible. Yeah, Ashley, or uh, not able to hear you. Ashley, you are on mute. Yeah. So, Ruchika, I haven't evaluated it from that perspective, but I think uh, on both the platforms, uh, like it was discussed in the earlier uh, question, I think what is important is for users to be made aware 
of the two risks that are there. Okay, one is obviously the risk about investing in that particular company. The other risk that the user is carrying is the currency risk, right? So I think awareness is important. The research availability is important. And I think today also the way the platforms are given to users is there are two distinct platforms. You know, for global investing, there is a platform as, and uh, when it comes to domestic investing, there's a platform. I think users have to be uh, uh, from a convenience and also from the ability to invest globally. If you could bring both of these together, merge it, then I think the traction is going to go uh, up even more. Also, from creating a portfolio, we don't need to see portfolios separately. The portfolios also should be showcased together that is going to drive traction further so yes that is uh, my view uh, another point sorry which i missed uh, speaking about is an aspect which comes into play also is about uh, remittance of money yeah. you know so how can we make the lrs process uh, much more seamless reduce paperwork and also make it quicker is an important uh, factor that will uh, determine how much of uh, or how many users will actually take up to it. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, and you know, since we've been talking about enhancements, and uh, I have a follow-up question, and Hina will start that with you uh, because we've seen that. So you know, we have like all stock brokers having the mobile trading applications, right? And this has actually made investments even more convenient. Now, the new generation of investment apps not only shifts trading, stock trading services to a mobile and more technologically advanced environment, but it is completely reinventing the customer experience itself. And that plays, you know, that itself is a USP. Now, have mobile trading application, everyone has it, but how different are you from others? So this is my uh, question to you, Hina, to begin with, and I would love to, you know, hear everyone's thought on it. So how and what do the stockbrokers ensure to keep, you know, an outstanding customer experience to keep their clients sticky? Because that is something, you know, which is very much crucial. Yeah. So uh, very interesting question. And this is my personal favorite, in fact. Uh, so uh, client experience for me starts from the time the customer register. And when mm -hmm. the customer decides to partner with us uh, for his investment or trading needs. I mean, you need to make uh, customer self-sufficient through digital assets, uh, through assistance. At the same time, you need to ensure to hand over the customer when he needs you. And from our interface, we've been trying to achieve the same. You talk about a feature to the journey. Everything has been built thinking and keeping the customer expectations and experience in mind from each dot to each click, to each screen that you look at have been extensively evaluated from that perspective. So apart from, uh, uh, from removing the pricing barrier completely, what we attempted to create is an experience for customer to have him fall for. I mean, you talk about uh, when, I, when I mentioned about the registration, it is as simple, easy, 15, five minutes onboarding, uh, a digital telecaller, you talk about any product or any order placement across the product is single click. Extremely simple and easy, intuitive uh, UI. So not only that, when you talk about platform, I also, also personally believe it's very, very important to have that servicing for the customer. And I said servicing, it, it should be a need when the customer wants to get in touch with you. So we also attempted multiple options for the customer where he can contact uh, using a single touch point as uh, every possible self-help that we could think of, which is which has a DIY help within the application itself. So experience is what I think is going to be a uh, make or break for any digital platform or a digital business. Great. Thanks, thanks for that, Hina and uh, Shishupal. I like uh, to understand, you know, your thoughts on it. Yeah, I would just like to take this uh, discussion mm -hmm. forward from where, what Hina just mentioned. So, for from a customer experience perspective, uh, what I would also add, you know, is uh, the overall performance of 
the mobile app okay so i definitely want my mobile app to be highly available 24 by 7 i definitely want my mobile app uh, to have an experience basically where i can understand where things are placed if i have to do something uh, how i can do it easily and on top of that consistency you know so whenever i am using the app i get the consistent experience so you know that consistency is very important along with the correctness of data so what we have really observed is that while there are active traders but most of the traders uh, you know or most of the customers would be coming to the mobile app to look at their portfolio you know most of the times so that that the data that we see in the portfolio has to be correct all the times you know so what for me is you know consistency is very important and the veracity of the data is very important as part of customer experience and on top of that the performance and the availability so those actually form the overall crux of the customer experience as we see today excuse me was i audible were you able to hear me yes yes, yes shishpal we can hear you so that's what you know i would define overall as a customer experience you know from a mobile app perspective oshika can you hear me yeah we can hear you yes yeah. yeah that's what i would like to share yeah. if anyone else has anything to share uh yeah so i would just like to add on uh, i think the way we need to really think about uh, customer experience in our sector is to really think that it's sector agnostic you know because people do not think of an experience in terms of what experience am i getting in bfsi i think they compare experience across so the experience that he would get on a netflix or an amazon or a swiggy is the same kind of experience that he would expect even from a vfsi app so i think you know it's as simple as providing an experience which is in line with all other sectors the best of the experience ease of transacting and ease of availing service i think if you just break it down into these two cohorts you are pretty much uh, sorted great Great. Thanks for that, and I agree to that, Ashley. Uh, so, Gaurav, what do you think? You know, what are your thoughts on bringing in? Uh, what could be? You know, how can you have your customers being sticky to your mobile application? Uh, so basically, uh, you know, what I think, uh, you know, I agree what my friend said uh, just now. I would like to add one point, which is, I think when we do customer engagement on all the mobile platform you know in physical world we used to talk about one to one uh, and a lot of people used to claim that service truly personalized right and then slowly slowly we moved to you know one solution for all the clients because everybody wanted to give same treatment to all the category of clients right, right. so then that, that was the centralization era then we moved to digit you know this is the digital era present so there also i believe that you know still people are stuck over there they make one solution and they think that this is going to serve all the clients so i personally feel that customer data platforms are going to play a huge role in terms of uh, you know they will also be very very important part of customer experience and that will take care of personal hype you know hyper personalization because what will happen we will have to go back one to one solution right so if there are you know let's say there are 1 million customers so there will be today most of the customer cohorts are based only on the basis of segments like uh, mm -hmm. for an example if people are investing in delivery they would be okay this is one segment people are investing only in delivery so i personally feel that hyper personalization will evolve in our industry over a period of time and that is going to be the big differentiator big differentiator great great thanks. and yes anand uh, you know would definitely love to hear your thoughts on the same and what is the differentiating point that you think you know can bring in that you can bring in your uh, mobile application so i think uh, all combined together what hina uh, hina mentioned or shishupad or gaurav or ashley uh, 
I, I, I believe that mobile application or website are just vehicle of dissemination of your company's proposition. That is just a medium of communication. However, actual experience is built by a design, product, customer service, operations team, or multiple functions of the organization. So when we have to look at experience, we have to think of total experience rather than customer experience. So all the system that needs to be connected well, if, if someone is trying to chat on your mobile application, mobile application doesn't talk, but the team behind or the bot talks about it. So that part of uh, experience needs to be taken care. If the salesperson or advisor needs to speak in case of non-digital uh, mode of communication, or if a research analyst need to punch in a research call, it is important that the system that he gets to punch in and the call that gets published on, on the mobile application comes real time so the opportunity is not lost. So uh, when, when we uh, are players who are among the decision makers to create what needs to be created, we should think about total experience, not limiting our thought process to only customer experience what customer sees, but overall ecosystem that we are creating, uh, ultimately, uh, customer is benefiting what we are doing it for customers, but other stakeholders are very, very important in building great customer experience. Thanks. And then I and you know, about customer experience, how can we get the buzzing words, AI and FL, you know, that's been something we've gained out. But actually, quite a surprise to me and you know actually your because uh, actually the market sector did a quarterly survey on EIML where it is from the top row area and actually no top row reported any use of EIML so according to if and what is the data science specifically referring to EIML does it play in the top market Uh, I don't think we could hear. Yeah, we couldn't hear Ruchika. Clearly. Yeah, Ruchika, I don't think we could hear you very well. So could you please uh, repeat mm -hmm. the question again, maybe with the video? I think I got that question. Oh, great. Then we can continue. Question. We can continue. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, uh, I think just to summarize the question, uh, Ruchika is uh, asking about what role AI ML act, you know, uh, plays and how uh, brokers are leveraging it because she, they, she didn't find evidence in a survey which was conducted that none of the brokers are using it so i think uh, obviously it is a buzzword and there is a huge potential in what aiml can do you know so uh, i think uh, uh, for example we have a 1 million customer base now if you really think of the segments that one can create in this uh, large base it's going to be huge but do i really need to think about my customers from putting them into segments the answer is no and why is that because every customer is different he can have different demographics he can uh, come from different backgrounds he can have uh, in different investment uh, behavior uh, he could be a trader for example he could be an investor he could be both he could just be derivative and i'm just giving you a very broad example examples but the nature of every customer is different so therefore how do i cater to his requirement and it is humanly impossible to break it down to be able to cater to individual requirements and that is where you need machine learning to help you now what machine learning can basically do is help you create like a DNA for every customer. So, you know, uh, you, we all understand how a DNA is, uh, which defines every individual. So it will help you create this kind of DNA and you can then collate people together. So one example that I would like to give for, let's say people who are holding TCS also have bought Infosys. So can I now recommend Infosys to the people who are holding TCS? So that is what, you know, AIML can uh, help you achieve. It can help you understand behavior at an aggregate level and then take it down to an individual level. It can do things like 
people who added stock A in their watch list have also added B, C, D. So therefore, now me as an investor, I know that, hey, why am I not looking at B, C, D? Those could be good opportunities that are available and there are others taking part of it. So, yeah, to cut the long story short, I think AIML has a huge role. There are many areas where uh, uh, in BFSI that we could use leverage and use it to nudge users as all as well as also give them a lot of insights to help them make uh, good investment decisions. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, Gaurav, Anand, you would like to add anything onto it? Any different thoughts? Or you are yes, on the I same page like with Achyu? Yes, yes. So basically, you know, as I said earlier, the customer data platform, I see that, you know, that is where we are going to use a lot of ML and AI. And it is going to create a huge difference, right? Anand and Shishupal spoke about creating wealth for client, choosing right stocks, right? So because today, you know, if you look at a lot of brokers, you know, irrespective of their sizes, uh, you know, we are trying to communicate the same thing to all the customers. It is about pushing, it is about selling, right? That way we can't create wealth for our clients. So if we really want to engage our clients in customer in a, in a customer centric approach, so I think uh, the customer AI and ML is going to be very useful in terms of right customer engagement, which is meaningful from the client perspective. And if it is meaningful, meaningful for clients, then eventually it will benefit to our business as well. Right? The second use case is the conversational AI, which is more practical, right? So if you look at a lot of AMCs, a lot of insurance companies, they have started utilizing conversational AIs in terms of, you know, uh, uh, to get the insurance from their existing customers. So their penetration uh, is improving in terms of, uh, you know, getting the business. So I was talking to uh, one or two companies. So I see that, you know, like Hina said that customer service is one of the main which is really, really crucial. And we see that a lot of brokers are getting failed. Today they are getting business, but if you want to make sure that they, the scale of business they are doing presently, if they want to hold on to that business, the customer service is something we can't really talk to us. 24 hours. So I think conversational AI has a capability which basically enable us uh, you know, to be available for customer 24 by 7. So these are the two use cases. I think uh, AI and ML are going to be really useful to make us pick. Great. Great. Thanks for that, Gaurav. And, you know, I agree to it. And since we're talking about AI, ML, you know, ultimately everything relies on a lot of data, whatever information we have, whatever data we have. And that gets me to another question. And Shishupal, if, you know, uh, you can answer that. So. We understand that technology to a larger extent helps investors, you know, make all the informed decisions. And many financial experts caution about the information overload. But, uh, and also according to them, millennials should start slow and they should uh, compile a diversified portfolio with different asset classes. Now, so what are your thoughts on this? When we talk about information overload, how do you plan to live with on, you know, the information overload? So basically, when we talk about information overload, you know, um, for millennials or for Gen Z, information is available across on the internet. You know, they can go to YouTube, they can go to Google, they can go to multiple sites, and the information is available. But what is really important uh, for any of the customers, you know, irrespective of the segments, irrespective of the generations, is you know, take, making a wise decision. It's a hard earned money, you know, and they, they need to make a wise decision. So what we really need to uh, what we really need, uh, really need to do from our side is provide our perspective. You know, to the customers when they are really trying to trade on our platforms, uh, either through awareness sessions or through the platform itself. You know, we make our own awareness videos. We make our own educational videos that helps them understand. You know, the perspective uh, from a stock broking perspective, and which could help them. You know, take a decision, a wise decision to build this overall wealth. So that is one thing. And from an information 
overall information perspective you know uh, sometimes you will also have to let customers you know do what they want to do by you know providing a soft intervention in terms of a hyper personalized advice or something you know on the platform itself or the tips itself which you could help uh, which could help customers if they want to but eventually if it is their decision to go ahead with whatever information they have and whatever a uh, decision they want to take at least they would understand you know that their the perspective was provided from the platform from the broker but eventually it is their decision it's a high risk market you know and everything is subject to market risk so basically i would say that wherever possible it is our responsibility to provide the right advice right educational uh, content right awareness to the customer in this entire journey of trading but eventually it's a customer's decision you know and basically they would definitely value the advice you know if they have gone into some uh, if they have taken some wrong step at some point in the journey so that's why that's how i take it basically yeah and i uh, i agree with shishupal and somehow i feel that profile based information would really really add value to this customer base i mean which is which has to be very pointed information that is consumable and understood by the customer and that will be done yeah. by ai and ml correct so True. The, Okay. Then thanks, thanks to that, and you know that gets me to another interesting question. We've been talking about you know cloud-based systems, the adoption of it. So we understand you know now there has been quite an unprecedented trading volumes, and then everyone is after delivering and enhanced you know trading experiences. Now for that there has been a talk of adopting innovative technologies, and one is going from going from on-prem to a cloud-based system. Now. uh anand then i would like you to take this up for uh can you elaborate like you know how adoption of cloud based systems have made life easier for the stock broking industry and also uh did you like how the stock broking houses you know manage the regulatory hurdles because it's not so easy right there's a lot of things that we talk on the uh data security front so how how has how the journey has been from going on prem to cloud or do you think on prem still persists you know so uh, for us uh, I, i will start a case uh, or conversation that where we are and where we were if i talk mm-hmm. about 2 to 2 and 1/2 years back uh, pre covid that is where uh, we realized that uh, and we saw that there is lot of traction in stock market industry and demand is surging a uh, lot of a lot of interest is being gathered and Uh, handling scale was becoming difficult and and uh, because of the mar- market market volatility interest also is as volatile as market so if markets are high you you see lot of lot of people coming in if markets are low you don't see people coming in so you cannot prepare for very high uh, users by investing in on prem infrastructure and if you are not ready with uh, to handle scale you will collapse when the flood comes in to to take care of all those things we decided that we have to start moving to cloud though it might sound expensive initially but it comes with lot of flexibility and that is where the journey started uh, for us around 2 2 and 1/2 3 years back and right now we are uh, our total infra on, on broking side or or mobile platform side wherever wherever we say we are 60% on the cloud right now we are not 100% on the cloud uh, we don't intend to be on 100% cloud uh, in very near term uh with time time will say but uh, largely wherever we have to increase or reduce bandwidth that setup or that tech setup has moved on the cloud side but i have recently heard certain conversation that certain financial institutions are are uh, looking back on the cloud that whether they should continue with the cloud or not i think uh, those uh, information uh, needs to be validated that what is their thought process what could be disadvantage if you go to the cloud but primarily at this point of time this is our experience what is happening in the industry we see that uh, cloud gives us lot of flexibility lot of flexibility to increase the capacity reduce the capacity with managing the costs as well and lot of innovations are happening on the cloud side uh, and uh, cloud is a, is a way forward for us as of now i can say but technology is changing <laughs> every month you you come to know something else so we don't know what will happen after 2 months or 3 months but as of now what th- what seems that cloud is the way forward for us chanan sure. and i would concur with that just to add few more things to that is basically uh, if you really see in the last 4 5 years what we have really seen is a keen interest in stock markets okay and that has also increased the overall number of users so 
right now we are in the scale up you know trajectory basically and stock markets are pretty volatile so right now you know uh, the active customers can go to a million and come, can come back to 55 uh, 50000 500000 so basically you have to manage that scale so cloud provides that flexibility from a scale up and scale down perspective first thing without investing you know from a capital perspective in the infrastructure the second thing that cloud provides is you know the compute that you need so basically you know the computational power is infinite as it is said in cloud but it is to an extent that we need so basically you know uh, the processing power that the cloud provides it's it's practically you know impossible to have on prem when required you can always invest for it but basically you really don't know how long you're going to use that investment so the third point is the storage you know with the last set of customers that are coming in every day and the way the markets are you know seeing the uptrend the amount of storage that we need today basically you know if we have to invest that in on prem on a regular basis is going to be pretty expensive so cloud provides that leverage from an overall cost perspective overall performance perspective overall scaling up scaling down perspective we have always heard of security as a concern yeah security will always remain a concern whether it is on prem or cloud uh, more on cloud because it is not something that we manage you know physically so basically that's where that uh, concern comes in but we also have to understand basically what data we should be able to move to cloud which we should keep you know so basically wherever it is pii either it is encrypted or, okay or either it is masked and then only move to cloud or we keep it on on prem wherever the rest of the data processing could still happen on cloud so cloud has a lot of flexibility and with the, the agile nature of business that we are into you know where we need a feature pretty soon we know we need to process uh, trillions of records basically on a on a daily basis you know cloud has the power to do that for us you know and that's where we see uh, the overall uh, usage of power increasing day by day i'm sure that it would be you know a way go forward for most of most of the organizations across the board um, the only risk that i see is basically you know the regulatory thing that right now but as far as you know we are open to you know as far as you know we keep the data within the country you know which is the data residency law basically which says that it should remain within india i think that's important if we are able to keep that i think uh, i don't see a lot of concern with the cloud adoption overall great great thanks for that uh, shishupal and uh, since we've been talking about you know the regulatory thing so, recently so, you know I, I would yes. uh, on the cloud side i want to add one more thing uh, on prem side now uh, because the kind of business we are in one factor mm -hmm. which is failovers and disaster recovery becomes very very critical yeah. because you can't think that someday for 3 hours any broker's platform will be down that will be unacceptable that is that, that is that is like fatal for any any company now uh, in the traditional way if you have to mm -hmm. create drs and failover setup you need to create all parallel 2x or 1.5x kind of setup that becomes damn expensive with with cloud as technology i think this dr and failover kind of mechanism gives a lot of efficiency uh, in terms of quick turnaround to to take the uh, negative side to neutralize those things i think uh, cloud cloud plays a very vital role there now great yeah i i totally agree with you anand and you know uh, next thing was since we've been talking about you know the uh, regulatory bodies now recently nsc in its you know uh, latest circular which was dated march 25th it actually you know uh, it directed the brokers to avoid using influencers to promote their businesses you know products and brokerage plans and also what do you what do you see this as and actually uh, i would like to start with you so what impact do you see of this latest circular you know uh, which has been which has which is kind of a curb on the referral program so do you see any change in the client acquisition plans or strategy yeah uh, so yeah i'm aware of the circular uh, rachika and uh, you know, I don't think it's going to dampen what we have seen uh, in the stock market. Because to think about it, uh, if you question, has the growth come because of influencers? I don't think the answer is yes. Influencers only aid in disseminating uh, the message of the broker, the proposition of the broker. But an absence of one particular medium there are several other mediums that come into play. For example, we didn't have social as uh, much as uh, today it helps in terms of marketing, right? Yeah. So I don't think it's really going to be uh, dampening the acquisition of uh, customers. So uh, uh, what 
I think brokers should focus on is uh, today most brokers are focusing, you know, crazy, uh, I mean, crazy uh, numbers on acquisition. But I think the focus has to be around UTC, which are unique traded clients. You know, what kind of customers are they onboarding? How many of those customers are actually transacting? Because the number game can only keep you happy for a certain amount of time. But if you're not going to get the right customers, and customers who are largely coming only for freebies, then uh, in the long run, that is going to uh, not aid you in your business model. So oh, I, think, I see a lot of clients oh, coming in. Will emerge, uh, Ashley, like us. Yeah, yes, <laughs> time will tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Great, so uh, Gaurav, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, what I think, you know, that uh, as Ashley also said that, uh, you know, this will bring uh, more meaningful investors or trader to the industry, right? So today, a lot of brokers, they just put the numbers for the sake of acquisition numbers. Uh, and, you know, look at the history whenever uh, SEBI or any exchanges has come with the, any kind of circular. It has benefited the industry in the long term. If you look at, you know, in terms of giving the leverages. Uh, you know, now if you are able to, uh, you know, uh, safeguard the wealth of customers by doing that, it is going to benefit to the industry and to the clients, right? The same thing will happen here also. So by implementing this, only the serious investor and traders will come in the picture. And, you know, it is not about just acquisition number or just buying, just showing the unique active client at NSC because that is where the story begins because you know you can have if you look at a lot of brokers they have been gifting free etfs also which is not a right way to do the business just to show the numbers see if you are talking about serious investors serious traders there has to be a intent of investing or trading if you are talking about investing it has to be like long term perspective for wealth creation if they are traders there has to be a frequency of trades so I think this is a very good circular and it will bring a lot of, uh, uh, you know, seriousness in terms of acquisition. And as Ashley also said, uh, I agree that it is not going to stop the growth of the industry. If any wrong channel is getting stopped or, you know, which is getting the wrong kind of clients, there will be two other channels uh, which will be evolving along with the time and they will be giving us serious investors or traders to the industry, which will be more meaningful for overall industry. Sure, I agree. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Gaurav. And uh, Hina, yeah, you know, we've been talking about millennials, but I think the next generation, which is, you know, Gen Z, I think that proves to be financially more sophisticated than any other previous generation, you know, was at their age. And also, but they have a lot to learn. So, Ina, the question is for you. Just wanted to understand, like, what is the plan that you would have to adhere to, you know, the needs of generation, someone who is very sophisticated and tech savvy, but less confident about financial knowledge. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, also, Ruchika, that what I believe and what I actually, what we are working towards also is that we should be able to provide the content and information which Ashley did also mention initially that we should be able to communicate a consumable knowledge to the customers. That is very, very important and a bit size information for him to consume and understand. So there is any which will a lot of noise in the market. There are a lot of advisories, uh, a lot of intermediaries which is available in the market. Uh, so. Uh, not only with the consumable knowledge, but we should be also be able to send actionable input to the customer to action on. So that right. is very, very important for a customer perspective or to act to action and uh, uh, become information savvy or in, instead of education that we feel that, okay, uh, we should have, I'm not against webinar or but it's very difficult to teach someone. It is right. easy for the person to learn by himself. Good. Thanks. Thanks for that. And uh, you know this. And this brings me to my last question, and that's quite open to, you know, each one of you. And this is something which is about you know buy now, pay later, because this is something which we which we have been hearing, 
you know in the financial industry now india actually ranks third globally among the 18 countries in share of consumers who have used bnpl option now that that may majorly because you know because of its hassle free zero interest short term uh, uh you know loans to make all kind but i want to understand what is your take in the stock broking where do you see this trend of buy now pay later are we too early or do you think you know we are already there i would like to understand like it's open to anyone who would like to take it up yeah uh, i think uh, you know so, uh, some brokers and i think even we are one of them who has already launched a buy now pay later and mm-hmm. i think it's just another way of looking at the margin trading product where a customer only pays part of the amount and the rest of it is financed so it is uh, indirectly actually a buy now pay later because the user is only putting a part of his funds uh into the equation and the rest is financed so it is already there ruchika i mean it's available as a product for investors great uh anyone else uh, you know who has a different the mtf as a product which is already <laughs> available in the market and customer can leverage on that after speci- specifically after there has been a regulations with regards to peak margins great uh so great i think uh, you know it's been great we are now open to the questions uh, from the audience so i already see you know a couple of questions and uh, i'll keep that open uh, one question that we have is what are the newer ways to monetize in this era of discount pricing so that top line still grows steadily who would like anyone would like to take that up so uh i yeah, go ahead uh so basically you know there are a lot of ways to monetize people are already monetizing you know if you look at i will take an example of uh, zero brokerage in delivery right uh so what do you think i mean uh, you know this is not actual zero it is it is just the way the pricing is presenting this is my perspective you know i don't want to hurt anyone's feeling uh, so it is just that you know there are ways uh, when people are investing for long term you know there are a dp transaction charges dp amc charges and eventually a client who invest in uh, you know long term he tend to trade in other segments as well right so if you look at if somebody is offering a brokerage in uh, you know delivery segment or intra seg- intraday segment which is zero eventually he makes money from other segments and plus if you look at all the big brokers which are listed on stock exchange if you look at their other income which consists of approximately 40% of total revenue which is quite huge so ultimately you know it is it is it is not free and uh, there are ways to monetize it as i gave two three examples dp transaction charges amc and then you tend to pay for advisory as uh, someone said in our panel that you know a uh, lot of uh, discount broker they are not giving advisory right so they enable other platforms and eventually if you want to use other platforms you will have to pay to consume their advisory right so that is where also the monetization come in the picture so i'll add your ruchika uh, from the uh, pricing perspective when uh, i'll talk for myself and when we talking about the pricing where where i mentioned that zero so zero itself is zero is uh, of course apart from the government charges so what we uh, what we believe from a so it's not about the discounting that i'm talking about from a discount broker model i'm talking with zero brokerage model now so it's it's like you pay a one time fee and then your entire brokerage is free across product there is no catch which we been mentioning about of course there are only government charges that goes to government again from amc perspective also there is only one time amc uh, which is a front and the amc is also going to be free for the lifetime so i would not compare with a zero the discount broker uh, broking model but i will definitely say it's a different segment which is zero brokerage model great yeah so ruchika i would like to think of this question a little differently and answer it a little differently too i think see 
people really pay for value you know if i see value in a product or a service i will pay for it so it is a phase i mean or you can say uh, uh, where you know there are discount brokers they have their own unique proposition and offering but that does not mean that premium services cannot exist there is a market there is an audience who understands what that service uh, provides in terms of value and there are people who are willing to pay that additional price so i think the answer to the question is really what value am i bringing to the table or to the client and what is he willing to pay if i'm going to bring value and expect a tremendously high uh, price then obviously people might not be willing to take it but if it is priced right and my value proposition is good then you will definitely <coughs> find take for it and there is definitely a revenue model that one can gain from great 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 uh, i think i'll move on to the next question and again it's open to you know uh, each of you with technology coming aggressively what will be the fate of traditional brokers how does stock broking look like going forward in next few years will it be complete online broking anyone would yeah. like to take it up yeah. i think it's just uh, you know what i just said uh, previously it is again uh, th there's a market available for everything there's a udp restaurant and there's a five star right they all exist and similarly in terms of cars there's a range of cars available so yes the traction for online is growing and it will grow because you've just added an entire new medium in which transactions can be done but that does not mean that branches won't exist there will be branches that exist because uh, uh, the branch experience is very different there is an audience that loves to go to a branch experience uh, markets talk to dealers understands uh, what what's going on uh, and then places its trades so uh, branches uh, definitely look like they will exist but at the same time uh, online trading is going to grow because that is what is going to enable us uh, to get a lot of penetration in tier 2 3 4 where putting physical branches uh, does not really uh, you know uh, make a lot of uh, sense from a revenue point of view but uh, the answer is yes uh, they continue to will continue to exist at least that's how uh, we look at it great uh, anyone else would like to take that or should i move on to the next question ruchika uh, i i have a yes, view sir. here uh, uh, we all know that technology is going to play a very vital role the way things have changed in last couple of years or few years uh, industry is being driven by tech driven players uh saying so technology will be a vital player uh, those traditional player who do not focus on technology to deliver the personalized advisory or rm driven or, or advisor driven uh, features or services mm -hmm. uh, they also need technology to deliver that though the proposition what ashley is saying uh, definitely is there but uh, your mode or the largest amount of users will reside on the technology driven platforms because uh, with discount brokerage or the yields going high in in stock broking industry uh, if uh, at the same rate someone expects that uh, relationship manager or advisor or dealer is, would be available that is not feasible one has to be practical in that case uh, if someone wants that Uh, they need to give the price for the value of person they if they they are wanting however scale will come from technology largest amount of user base will are there and will continue to be on on technology driven platforms okay i think the next question is actually you know a kind of a follow up to the advisory services that we've been talking so the question is aren't there certain complications and limitations sebi for when discount brokers want to provide advisory services Uh, i will take that one uh, ruchika i don't oh. think so uh, there is a limitation that any broker cannot pro uh, broker or advisory 
i think all 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 of them are different uh, uh, different roles broking is a role where a person is becoming a member of of a of an exchange mm-hmm. uh, there is a role under which uh, research houses give recommendations or ras what we call research analysts to give that advice that someone can buy or have a target price or an entry price for a particular stock that is being provided by research analyst and there is another thing called ria which is uh, rias are there who are there to give advice to uh, the customers uh, the problem there is if a broker is taking a ria license he cannot take Uh, revenue out of the brokerage his revenue should mm-hmm. come from ria ria fee okay. however research analyst and broker can come together however mm-hmm. ria and broking coming together is is a complex work got it uh one question which we have already covered which is what are the features that you would look forward provide on the mobile app for enhancing the customer experience so i think we actually spoken quite a lot about it uh one question i'm sure you know which you all would relate to is uh, relate to is what panel we on the peak margin since this peak margin can't be passed on to customer and how are you communicating clients on peak margin status on a real time basis uh, anyone would like to take that up so basically everything because this is the ex- exchange regulation everything is built into the system itself right and uh, this is a need of the r and uh, it's part of the platform feature uh, it's also important that how do you communicate how do you how do you nudge how do you show as a display on the screen and uh, so combined all uh, is very, very important for the customer to be aware of it's got the platform itself ruchika i just wanted to add uh, you know what hina said just now mm-hmm. so one is that you know uh, all of uh, you know we see a lot of uh, brokers communicating uh, you know things which they want to sell they use all the channels right and when it comes to communicating which is related to service mostly sms and emails are the only communication channels are used so i personally feel that there is a scope of improvement other channels can also be leveraged because you know people who are traders who are contributing in the revenue pie they are very small in terms of percentage as compared to the larger pie so if you take care of that it will enhance the customer experience great thanks i think that brings us to the end of the questions from the audience and yes kartika over to you Yes, thank you so much, Rishika. Thank you so much to all the speakers. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation. I definitely learned a lot, and I could see that the audience also learned a lot because they were interacting quite <laughs> a bit. So, thank you so much, everyone. If you anyone has some closing remarks, uh, please feel free. So it, it's the amazing experience. I mean, uh, to interact with the industry friends uh, that we've made today. and their perspective which is very very important to take back and reflect upon thank you hina yes it's really uh, an interesting conversation i, I think i think it has happened thank I you for the way i told this is just the beginning of change of financial industry uh, we are into a uh, lot of innovative product solutions are yet to come you are the you are the youngest one in the in this group as a, as a brand right now here sorry was it for me like, m stock yeah. is the youngest brand yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's 10 days old yeah though we've been there in the uh, 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 in india for past 15 years and in globe for past 25 years and the number 1 in south korea for securities and number 3 in indonesia so that's that youngest we are <laughs> okay cool then yeah. yeah yeah so kartika ruchika thanks uh, thanks, thanks for the panel discussion uh, very thanks. interesting topic and it was a pleasure being here thank you so much thank you.
it is definitely thank you thank you everyone thanks to the audience thank you thank you everyone thanks to the audience uh, for being amazing thank you so much all the speakers all yeah. right i'll conclude bye -bye. the session thank you thank you, thank you. Yeah. Bye, -bye. Thank you. bye.